All right. I'm Tim Gelbach from Block Mason, and I think the best title for this talk would be called would be something on the lines of blockchain, the database metaphor. And what I want to do is use our current product, the credit protocol, as a case study in how we can use blockchains more as databases and follow that line of thinking going forward. So before we go forward, I think it's really important to go back and look at the metaphors that have, the two metaphors that have really dominated blockchain thinking up to this point. So the first one for cryptocurrency is the currency metaphor. And this is when you think of crypto, especially Bitcoin and Ethereum, as something that you either hold as much of as you can and store up, or use for payments. And so whenever you see a new project, and there's lots of really good ones, I love the payment use, that are doing anything on the lines of transferring money or storing it in different ways, this is the metaphor that's central in their minds. Cryptocurrency is a currency that you move around, store, and use to settle the payments. The next metaphor that I think has gained a lot of traction and is still really, really, really the one that's centered in people's minds is smart contracts. And I think the word contract has really put everyone's thinking in a mode of either securitization, how can we take money flows in, do crowd sales, you know, split the money flows out, um, or something on the lines of legal contracts. Code is law, how do we make sure that like, you know, this thing that we do in code becomes a binding legal agreement. But I think there's another metaphor that's extremely powerful and we're going to see a lot more in the next couple years. And that's cryptocurrency as a database. And so I would call this the database metaphor. The best way to think of it is whenever you're running something like an Ethereum program and you don't care how much money is in the contract, you only care about the data that it's storing, you're using the database metaphor. And what blockchains allow us to do that we have never been able to do before is have these decentralized programmable databases that we can update without trust and take a lot of mental effort away from humans. So what we have now is we can put state up in the database and even in the presence of malicious actors and malicious nodes trying to change the state um, or people like users going in and trying to set it to different things we're pretty confident that if you've programmed the rules correctly, you can trust the data you have up there. This is completely unprecedented. And so what I want to do is look at the protocol that we've developed and how it takes advantage of that. Because I think it's a good case study in how much you can do with Ethereum without using anything related to currency or even legal contracts. So at its base, our product, the credit protocol, is a protocol to handle the recording of a debt between two parties. So in the simplest example, the devil creates a notification on the blockchain that I owe him my soul. He doesn't say what it's for, maybe it's a Lambo, something like that. I go ahead, I look on the blockchain, you know, probably at the same time as him, I see that notification and I agree. I use my ID in Ethereum to confirm that I saw what he said I owe him, my soul, and I record in the blockchain that I owe him that. That sounds really, really simple. But if we actually look at some of the simple cases that people have been trying to do for a while, we see how much stuff gets unlocked by this and how different it is from current database solutions that we have. So probably the simplest case study that I usually give to people is how do we track debts between friends? And there's a lot of approaches that have been developed for this. The obvious one that people have been using for thousands of years is you keep track mentally. And it works all right as long as your friend isn't a deadbeat or isn't the friend who always tries to avoid buying beers or something like that. But it adds a lot of mental overhead. You're constantly trying to remember who paid for what and you've taken all this stuff that could be done by pen and paper or computers and offloaded it to human brains. So, you know, people use that sometimes. It works great. You know, most friend groups work this way. Cool. The next one is maybe you keep a document, either on pen and paper or on the cloud. The problem there is that we don't get any guarantees when we see that document about how it was created. If I have a spreadsheet that says, I owe my friend $50 for hamburgers on this day, he owes me $20 for beers on this day, we have no knowing 
of whether that information is valid in any way except for the fact that, you know, one of us has edit privileges on the document. But we have no guarantee that both of us confirmed that. You could also write your own program. You know, if you're a decent programmer, you can go get like, you know, a server online, write a little web app that lets, you know, me submit something saying my friend owes me $50, lets him confirm on the web app, and then a month later, we stop paying our server charges and the app goes away. If anyone's really old, I mean, everyone had like a GeoCities page 20 years ago. Those don't exist anymore. MySpace, I'm not sure. There's a lot of apps people make that you know, you stop maintaining it and it's not there and all of that data is just gone and it makes you less likely to want to use it for these types of purposes. So the next solution is you want to make sure the data doesn't go away. So the usual way to do that is to use very large bureaucracies. One is to use apps to store the data and hope that the app is well funded enough that if me and my friend use it to track debts and confirm them with each other, you know, we hope that company stays in business. The other solution that uses bureaucracies would be something like Venmo, where you use the fact that you've connected lots of large multinational institutions to send, you know, 50 to $300 debts between friends, and it works. It's just massive overkill for something that with blockchain, you can have out there and have a guarantee for every recording of debt between two parties that both those parties knew about it, agreed to the amount, and even if they both get bored of the protocol, as long as Ethereum, for example, is still running in 10 years, they can go back and get that any time. They don't have to worry about continuing to pay for a server or whether a company goes out of business or coordinating like, you know, large multinational institutions to do a simple thing like this. That's what we mean by using the blockchain as a database. And you can take this idea way further than simple debts between friends. What you can do once you have that protocol in place is generalize on the fact that most, there's so many transactions that happen without payment that involve some kind of obligation between parties. The obvious example would be that once we have this layering um, of clear recording of debts, we can start putting stuff on top of that, right? You can start making a program that says, okay, as long as I know I have this contract down here and I can call it, I can write a program that puts collateral on top of that and says, okay, call the contract. If you see that, you know, one party is late and hasn't, like, you know, paid their debt in this amount of time, they take the collateral back. You could make le real legal contracts. You could do an auto loan where I loan you $5,000 to buy a car. We sign a legal contract that says the blockchain will be the source of truth for whether, like, that debt has been paid back. And if it's not, I would expect in the next couple years, we'll start to see courts use that as an enforceable thing. So rather than using smart contracts to put law on the blockchain, we use the blockchain to improve real world law, which is much more compatible with current systems. It goes way beyond even monetary debts. If you think of a school's meal plan at its base, all it really is is an obligation of, you know, 100 meals per semester to each student. And each time the student redeems those meals in the cafeteria, what's really happened and what you want to track is that the school now owes them one less, one less meal. And you can use real world payment systems to just give the school $500 and now they update the amount of meals that they owe you. Same for like loyalty points, airline miles, points at like a coffee shop. Those are all just debts that that company owes you that accrues over time and should be tracked on the blockchain. It shouldn't be tracked in like the form of some random database for you know, American Airlines or British Air or something. It should be in a public form that's accessible. Obviously, you can encrypt it, have privacy. But at its heart, it's a credit obligation. Consumer loans are one we just talked about, and that's also extremely similar. The thing I really want to emphasize about using the blockchain as a database is as soon as you stop thinking about things in terms of payments, currency, and securitization, the amount of things you can do opens up drastically. Governments really, really, really care about how, who owns money and how you move it. And this is why it's become so much harder to you know, buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other cryptocurrencies because they've cracked down so much on exchanges and made it so much harder to move money around. 
they care a lot less about how you track loan state, or even if we expand it further, you know, how you track graphs in a social network or other kinds of digital assets that you own. As soon as you use it for that, you're not fighting against governments anymore. You're going with the stream and producing innovation that, you know, they want because it produces growth. And I think that I love what the crypto community has done with payments and securitization, but they've been fighting an uphill battle. And I think it slowed things down a lot. And I think as we move to this metaphor of the blockchain as a database, it's going to rapidly increase the amount of innovation we have and the number of applications that are available. Finally, for our, for our token, uh, for the credit protocol, we didn't do it as a security. Because as soon as you move away from your token representing some kind of money flow or payment, you immediately unlock the ability to make it a real product use token that will stand up to the various US SEC tests and laws that have been passed over the years, which I'm happy to go into more detail with over there as it's like a fairly short presentation. All right. That's all I wanted to say about this for now. I hope everyone at least has some slightly different ways of seeing things. I'll be over there for the next hour or so at our booth for the credit protocol. Feel free to come over, ask me any questions. Have a great rest of the day.